Welcome to Next on the Tee with Chris Mascaro, where PGA and LPGA players, legends, and top instructors share their stories, insights, and playing lessons. Join Chris every Tuesday night as he talks with the greats of the game. Tonight's show is sponsored by the French Lick Resort, the PGA Tour Superstore, TaylorMade Golf, the Bobby Jones Apparel Company, Two Under, Ben Hogan Golf, Golf Pride, Srixon and their Z-Star Golf Balls, and the Sandiston Resort. Now here is your host, Chris Mascaro. Good evening, folks, and welcome to this week's edition of Next on the Tee. I'm your host, Chris Mascaro, and tonight I get to share not only three great guests with you, but also three really great friends as well. First up will be one of the most decorated instructors in the game and one of my all-time favorite guests here on the show, Eric Johnson. Eric is a four-time Tri-State PGA Teacher of the Year. He's also a four-time Horton Smith Award winner for his contributions to continuing education within the game. Tonight, I'm going to get Eric's thoughts on Matt Kuchar deciding that grains of sand are loose impediments in waste bunkers, which really blew me away. I don't know if you saw that, but you need to go Google that if you haven't and take a look at that video. Grains of sand are a loose impediment in a waste bunker. The first thing that blew me away is the fact that Cooch even had the thought to go call a rules official over to talk about it and take a look at it, and then they let him get away with it. So I want to get uh, Eric's thoughts on that. I want to get his thoughts on who the PGA Tour Player of the Year should be, plus on his thoughts on the President's Cup and if, if Tiger should pick himself to be a playing member of that team. So a lot to get into with Eric. Very excited he is back with me tonight. He'll join me in just a few minutes. Following him, I'll get a return visit from another great friend, Mitch Lawrence. As you all know, Mitch is the host of Talking Golf Getaways, a wonderful golf podcast. You hear me talk about it every week at the top of the show. I'm a huge Mitch Lawrence fan. It's a fantastic show to listen to. Please go check it out. He and his co-host, Darren Bunch, do a great job letting us all know about great places to stay and play around the country. You can find their podcast on Golf Trip X, and that's a letter X, so GolfTripX.com. Tonight, I'm going to talk with Mitch about a great event he just hosted at Sweetens Cove, just outside of Chattanooga. Sweetens Cove is one of Golf Week Magazine's top 100 you can play. So we'll hear about that event and get his feedback on the course. We'll also talk about his recent trip up to northern Michigan and the courses that he got to play up there. Very excited to have Mitch back on the show. He'll join me a little bit later on in this half hour. Then we'll round out tonight's show with a return visit from a third great friend, Paul Grandgard. Paul's been doing great things on the retail side of the business. He saved the Allen Edmonds Shoe Company from bankruptcy several years ago. And not only was he the CEO that led them back from the brink to great success, he kept their shoe factory right here in the U.S. in Minnesota at a time when most other shoe companies were moving their manufacturing plants offshore. He recently moved on from there to be the founder and CEO of a new apparel company called Circle Rock. Their clothes are made here in the U.S. as well in Minnesota. We'll talk about why it's so important to him to keep manufacturing jobs right here in the U.S. We'll talk about the great apparel that they have. They've got wonderful casual and dress shirts. I've got my eye on their sweater vests as well because when it gets cold outside, I don't like playing in bulky jackets. I like to keep my arms free so I can swing normally, and their vests look absolutely amazing. We'll talk about all the things that they've got going on when Paul joins me about 45 minutes from now. So there you have it, folks. More great stories and information coming your way on this edition of Next on the T. And as always, thank you so much for tuning in and taking the journey with me tonight. Since I have Mitch Lawrence with me tonight, I would typically kick it off by reminding you about his great show, Talking Golf Getaways. We'll talk about that when he joins me. So let's start by talking about his twin brother, Matthew's show, Backspin Golf. That show airs Sunday mornings from 8 to 9 a.m. Eastern Time on WLXG ESPN Radio AM 1300 up in Lexington, Kentucky. You can stream the show online by going to WLXG.com or doing what I did, which is download the WLXG app. Stream it right there on your smartphone. Matthew always makes the show so much fun to listen to. He's a great guy. He's a great host and a lot of great golfing content as well. It's a great way to start your Sunday mornings. Again, it's called Backspin Golf, and you can stream it online at WLXG.com or download the WLXG app. And folks, as you know, we are sponsored by the French Lake Resort. Let's take a listen to our good friend Steve Rondonero about what's going on up there this summer. It's a Pete Dye masterpiece, the Pete Dye course at French Lake Resort. Pete says its location on one of the highest points in Indiana makes it special. The long views, you can see many 20, 30 miles from many of the fairways and many of the tees and greens. 
and, and you can see a 360 degree. Donald Ross's hill course put French Lick on the golf map more than 100 years ago. It's where Walter Hagen won the 1924 PGA Championship and the place where today's Symmetra Tour ladies battle each year. It's the ambience around it that makes the golf course. Combine our many resort amenities with legendary golf and you have a getaway like no other. French Lick Resort is the home of the Senior LPGA Championship, won in 2018 by World Golf Hall of Famer Laura Davies. Play the course's champions play. Plan your trip now, online at FrenchLick.com. Yeah, folks, be sure to check them out online at FrenchLick.com to see for yourself what a wonderful place they have up there and to book your stay as well. And well, folks, TaylorMade Golf has done it again. The TaylorMade M5 and M6 drivers are a tremendous story. They both feature speed-injected twist face created through a revolutionary manufacturing process where every single head, and I do mean every single head, is injected and calibrated to the threshold of the legal limit. So basically, every head is made, made to be tour spicy. So speed for all. Check it out online by going to TaylorMadeGolf.com. And to play a ball with ultimate spin and stopping power, you need a physics-defying cover with molecular bonds that stretch but don't break. To play a ball that goes far and feels soft, you need a fast layer core with incredible feel and maximum distance. They're only in the new Z-Star and Z-Star XV golf balls, and they're only from Strixon. Please also check out our friends at the Bobby Jones Apparel Company by going online to bobbyjones.com. Their new fall collection is out. You're going to see Steve Stricker, Miguel Angel Jimenez and Ernie Els wearing it out on tour. Check it out online by going to bobbyjones.com and enter the code next on the T to save 10% at checkout. All right, now back and get this, folks. Making his 14th appearance with me on the French Lick Resort guest line is Eric Johnson. Let me remind you about Eric's background. He played his college golf and was a four-year letterman at Mississippi State from 1992 to 1995. Helped them win back-to-back Kroger intercollegiate titles in 94 and 95. Golf Magazine has named Eric a top 100 instructor every year since 2011. He was also recognized by Golf Digest as a top 40 under 40 teacher. He is a four-time Tri-State PGA Teacher of the Year going back to 2005, 2008, 2011, and 2018. He is also a four-time Horton Smith Award winner for his contributions to education. Eric played out on the Canadian Tour, the Sunshine Tour, and the Golden Bear Tour. He was the Director of Instruction at Oakmont Country Club for many years. He is now the Director of Instruction at Nemecolin Woodlands Resort, which is an amazing resort up in Farmington, Pennsylvania, which is a little southeast of Pittsburgh near the West Virginia border. And Eric is not only one of my all-time favorite guests, but he is also one of my all-time favorite people on the planet. And I'm very honored he is back with me again tonight here on Next on the Tee. Hey, how are you, my friend? Chris, what an introduction! I I really appreciate it, buddy. I I I I was blushing there as you were talking, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Most prepared man on radio. How many times have I said it? I don't know. A bunch. I Maybe thirteen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, but I want to start right there because I want to acknowledge again the recent awards. Right, you win the Tri-State PGA Teacher of the Year award for a fourth time. You back that up with a with winning the Horton Smith Award back in February. You're such an amazing teacher. I think your knowledge and personality are two of the big reasons that you're so successful and so sought out. But talk about the things that you do and why education, like I say, that Horton Smith Award, your dedication to education around the game. Talk about why that's so important to you. Well, Chris, I, thanks, buddy. I, you know, that was, uh, you know, it was very humbling and, um, you know, fourth, Teacher of the Year and fourth Horton Smith Award winner, and I, you know, um, you know, there are so many people that got me to this point, and so you know, I think of the Mike Adams in the world, and Bob Fords, and and Joe Gilbo's, and all these professionals that helped me, and Jim Flick. I mean, Jim Flick was a huge mentor of mine, and all these guys that helped me, that really. I don't know what they saw in this little kid from Titusville, Pennsylvania, but they they always tried to help. And and I I swear to God I wouldn't be where I am today without Bob Ford. I mean he was instrumental in my career. I spent 17 years at Oakmont, which is you know I was there for four U.S. Opens. I mean um, 
you know, and to, to think that he's given me this opportunity and the lifestyle that, that I've, that I've come to have is, is amazing to me. And so the only way, and I've said this to him, the only way that I can, you know, to, to, to give back to you is to help the future generation like you've done to me. And that's the only reason that I do what I do. I, I, the, you know, these awards, they're great and all, but I, I don't do this because I want to win awards. I do this because I want to help people. And at the end of the day, if maybe a few more people in the world would have that attitude, maybe it'd be a little kinder world out there, but just my take. So, you know, to that end, Eric, I, I have to imagine all the students that you've had and you've had a wide impact on so many players' lives, whether it's, you know, guys that are, you know, going to college or junior golfers or people out on tour or just, you know, regular Joes like me, it's got to be awfully fulfilling to you to see how your touch and your influence has gone out there on so many other people. When you're looking at some of the students that you've had and talking back to guys that you've taught over the years and guys and gals for that matter, what what are some of the touching things that you know you you know you know what I've done a, I, I've done a good job here I've really left my mark on some folks and that's got to be really fulfilling. Well, it, it is. I you know, and again, I I try not to think about these awards, but I really see it as helping helping humans. And you know, I knew when I got an email from a guy in Africa who saw the African wow. uh, golf uh, magazine and asked me a question about what I had written in there, then I knew something was up. You know what I mean? Like, and it, it, it's funny, like, I, you know, I was in the magazine five times last year and and had, you know, some pretty good instructional tips in there. And my kids see it and they're like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> and they don't even, they don't even get it. They're like, oh, yeah, there you are. Okay, whatever, Dad. <laughs> you know, so I mean, at the end of the day, you know, my kids keep me humble on it. They're like, yeah, okay, whatever, Dad. That's just you, you know, okay. And, uh, <laughs> you know, but I, I, I knew something was up when I got that email from Africa. And and he sent me a swing and he, we, we emailed him back and told him what I thought. And, you know, it was, it was really something. I, you know, I mean, I, you know, when you're, yeah. when you're with these guys and you're hanging out and, you know, at the top 100 teachers summit and you're looking around and you've got, you know, all your idols growing up and the new young guns coming out to knock you off. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's pretty cool. I, I will say that. No doubt. Yeah. All right. So I, I've got to switch gears a little on you, Eric, because I want to get your thoughts on the, probably the latest controversy out on the PGA tour involving Matt Kuchar. This hasn't been a really good Matt Kuchar year. I'm, and I'm sure you saw the <laughs> video of Kuch at the European Open over the weekend calls a rules official over, over and successfully argues that clumps of sand in a waste bunker are a loose impediment and then proceeds to peel out grains of sand everywhere because it's from behind his ball. So I, I can't believe they let him do it. I can't believe he even tried to do it. And then he gets away with that and, and moves on. But that is absolutely driving me nuts. The grains of sand in a waste bunker are can be you know termed loose impediments. What's your thought? <sighs> That's that could be worse than when Tiger moved the twelve zillion pound boulder. I mean, I, I, I've never seen. I you know, come on now. I, you, and you're correct. He's not having a real good year. I mean, you know, come on. You're out there on the PGA Tour, and I'm a little stirred up about this one too. But you know, when you win on the tour, and how much money has this guy made? And then he's gonna stiff his caddy. Because in Mexico, because he said, well, I didn't have a, you know, we had a contract, and you know what? Do what's right. Do what's right. Give this guy 150 grand and change his life. You know, you he flies around on a jet everywhere you go, and I'm not so sure he's the smartest tack in the bunch. And <laughs> what I saw there was a little, just uh, you can, you can, you can try to bend a rule, but flat-ass break it? I mean, come on now. And, and to to let the official say, oh, yeah, go ahead, it's waste marker. You can uh, take all these impediments out there. You, know, you hit it in there. You should be mad at yourself. Don't break a rule and, and hit it. You know, I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. But this thing with this caddy, 
I think that had me more disgusted than than anything I've I've heard this year. I mean, he's going to make what five six million this year, and you're going right. to stiff a caddy for a hundred grand? Come on, man! You, you're sponsored by NetJets for God's sake. That that's that's the fuel to get to Mexico. Now, come on. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right, so. Let's go to the PGA Tour Player of the Year. That's another big topic of conversation. In your mind, who deserves it? Is it Brooks? Is it Rory? Is it someone else? Oh, I think it's Brooks. I just, you know, what he's done in the majors has has been pretty pretty remarkable. And and you know, I wish, I just wish, it's a little bit like Tiger. You wish he'd play a little more. And you wish he'd do a little better in the, like the regular season stuff. And, you know, Tiger's been like, like kind of non-existent and maybe he was injured. Maybe who knows, but you know, the, the, how many surgeries this is, but you know, with Brooks, I just think, you know, he's, he's out in front. Um, I think the guys are pretty intimidated by him. I think what he did earlier in the year and I was at, uh, where was it? Canadian opener, wherever, you know, he just, destroyed Rory wherever it was. I mean, like they were, it was WGC, whatever it was. And he just, yeah, the WGC Rory had a two shot lead and, and just blasted right by him. And, and, you know, I, and I think he's got people intimidated and he's kind of doing some tiger stuff back from like the early two thousands when he would, you know, when he came out and said, well, there's only 20 people that can win a major and like 10 of them, only 10 of them will have their game at that week. And you go, you know he's right because if I'm in a major, the only thing I'm trying to do is make the cut to make a paycheck. You know, and, he, and there's a lot of other guys out there too doing the same thing. Just man, I hope I make the cut this week, and you know, get a few points, get some money, and and then there's only like 20 guys that can probably win it, and he's probably right then. And then half of those guys aren't going to have their game, so all I got to beat is like nine guys. And you go, wow, okay, this is frighteningly uh, honest and probably very correct um you know i'm not sure you're worried about um you know a lot of people during a major i mean really you you could probably name 100 guys off the tour you go right down the the list and go yeah he's not winning a major and and it's probably true you know i bet you i bet you would be an interesting thing if we sat down and hashed that out and said here are the 20 people that i think can win a major or you think can win a major I, I bet you right. we'd be pretty surprised. It, it's a pretty small list. So I and, think I'm going to give it to Kepka. I think, you know, Roy came on late at the end, but, you know, he's so spotty. You know, he's either really good or he's really bad. You know, I mean, missing the cut at his hometown in and, and Ireland and in the British Open, excuse me, the Open Championship. Um, uh, you know, it's just, <laughs> it, it, it's funny that, you know, it makes an eight on the first hole. I mean, come on, man. You grew up there. You shot 61 on the golf course. So I'm going with Brooks. Yeah. Well, it, and it's, you know, it's, it's your, to your previous point, right? That's a, the same thing that Jack Nicholas used to say, right? There's only a handful of guys that, uh, that think they can win. And there's only a handful of them that, uh, that aren't going to choke. And I'm not going to be one of them. Yep. So, um, yeah, right on the same, uh, same sort of wavelength yep. there. Yep. Speaking of Tiger a moment ago. We got the President's Cup coming up here soon, and, and uh, the world team looks pretty strong to me this time around. But uh, your thoughts on the President's Cup? Can we rebound from what we had last year at the Ryder Cup, you know, get the U.S. team back in the right frame of mind? And do you think Tiger should pick himself to play on the team? Well, we'll we'll probably win because it's not a Ryder Cup. So, you know, that's the good news. <laughs> we can't seem to win one of those, but the you know, President's Cup, we got that in the bag. But um, no, I, I'm kidding, of course. But the uh, the you know the international team looks stronger than they have in the past. Um, there's some actually some really good players on there. Um, I think it'll be close. Um, I, I you know listen, we went back. I I had some kid, you know, that I taught years ago said, "You said Tiger would never win again," and I said, "You know what? I, I still." You, you never can bet against the guy. I mean, period. And and I wasn't rooting for him not to. I I, I think it's awesome for the game. And um, we've talked about this in the past. I'm not sure, you know, about personally what I think about him. But when you think about 
on the golf course, it's, it moves the needle like no one in golf maybe ever has from Arnold Palmer, maybe Jack and maybe Greg Norman and, you know, some of those big guys that, that, that really could move the needle. Um, so, you know, from that standpoint, uh, we haven't seen him play much. I mean, after the Masters, we kind of lost track of him, really. I mean, he really, I think he only played 12 or 13 times this year. Uh, goes to the right. Open Championship, you know, looks awful, looks sore, looks tight, uh, you know, misses the cut down the road pro, you know, I mean, um, so he hasn't, he hasn't played a lot. Um, and in this recent surgery, you know, I don't know, uh, if I was Tiger, um, maybe I'd sit it out. Um, but that being said, it's Tiger Woods, you know, I mean, you, you, you've got, in my opinion, the second greatest player ever in the history of the game. Um, you know, second to Jack. And I still believe that, you know, a guy wins 18 majors and, you know, I, I still, I still tip my hat to Jack a little bit, but I, I think that Tiger should have had 30 majors by now if he hadn't have switched all the coaches. And I, I will say that. I don't care if Hank Haney or Sean Foley or, you know, you know, anybody's there in front of me, I would still argue that point. That I think if he was still with 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 Butch, he would have thirty thirty five majors by now. Yeah, you know, I mean, you'd have to fix some of the hyperextension of the knee and some of the stuff he was doing there. But uh, and you know, he could have still had some injuries. But I think if he hadn't have changed his coaches so many times, and I mean, it was he didn't go eighteen months, you know, with with Hank before he won, and then. You know, with uh, Sean Foley, it was another couple of years, and you just you just look at the wasted time, in my opinion, when you tried to fix something that wasn't broke. Eric, let's uh, switch gears again, and I want to get a couple of playing lessons from you before I let you go. And one of the things I heard uh, I'm talking about this morning on the PGA Tour radio channel on uh, Sirius XM was around par threes and using a tee or not, and it's something that. My buddies and I have debated over the years. I got one buddy who just throws the ball down on the ground, feels like it's just like any other pitch shot, and he, you know, hits it from there. And I, if they're gonna, if you're gonna let me use a tee, I'm gonna use a tee. And I stick a peg in the ground every time on a par three. What's your thought? What do you teach your students to do? A par three, tee or no tee? I mean, uh, to me, this isn't even a question. This is like, if the USG is gonna let you cheat and put it up on a tee, then you need to cheat and put it up on a tee. You got a perfect lie. You got nothing. You got no grass, no water, no air, no nothing behind the ball. That's what you got to do. You know, these guys that throw down on the tee, I laugh at them all the time. I go, man, it, 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 they give you a tee for a reason. <laughs> you know, it's to help you. And why not let it, why not let it, you know, get up in the air a little bit and kind of get the club under it a little bit. I, I, tee is the way to go with 100%. I've never done. I've never done right. it without one. I've even done it with a sandwich. I've teed off of the sandwich. I put it on a little tee, just just a little bit to get it up in the air, and boom. You know. Yes. Gotta use a tee. With ya. Yeah. Eric, one of the things we've been talking about here on this show. One of the other things we've been talking on the show lately is about you know I, I've sort of adopted the mindset that like look I'm a weekend hacker. I'm not good enough to be pin hunting you know out there on the golf course and. So I've, I've sort of adopted the theory that I'm going to shoot for the middle of the green, you know, regardless of where the pin is. If I catch it a little thin and it happens to be in the back, maybe I get lucky and the ball rolls to the back and uh, I'm, I'm in good shape. If I catch it a little heavy and the pin's in the front, then I, again, I get lucky and I'm closer to, to the pin. So when you're out there talking to guys like me, weekend hackers that are, that are out there playing, when you're talking strategy, are you pin hunting? Should I be pin hunting? And I'm just kidding myself or am I doing the right thing? No, I think you're doing the right thing. I, I always used to talk about this 80% rule. If I didn't feel like, like say I'm on a par five and I've got 230 out and, and you know, let's say I didn't think that I could hit that shot 80% of the time, I wouldn't even try it. You know, I mean, you, you kind of got to know your own game and, you know, it, it's frightening when I watch some players and, and I see the misses and what they're trying to do. And, 
it's it's always comical when I say, "Hey, what were you trying to do there?" And like, well, I was trying to take five iron out over the lake and cut it back to the to the to the hole. And I'm like, wait a minute, hold on a second, you're trying to do what? You know, I mean, I don't know if Tiger could do that in his prime. And, 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 you know, there's nothing wrong with playing safe, you know, I mean, and what I mean by that is, you know, and I probably got, you know, learned this lesson at Oakmont. First hole is 460 yards at Oakmont. It's one of the hardest holes in the world. And I would hit a four iron off the tee and people are like, why aren't you using your driver? Well, because I can make par if I'm past the hole in two strokes. If I can't get past the hole in two strokes, I'm not making a par. And so then, you know, it's all downhill after it. And then I'd hit like four iron. I'd hit an eight iron. It hit kind of middle of the hill, roll 40 yards down the hill, and I'd make par there a lot. And when you're playing in the SWAT and you got to make pars and the pars are good scores out there, uh, I learned how to play somewhat conservatively. And and on a U.S. Open golf course especially, you know what I mean, uh, as fat, firm and fast as the golf course is, you, can, you, you don't have to hunt at every pin. You know, you forget that par is a really good score. If you went out there on the tour and they have that – they have that every year. If you shot par at every event, what would you shoot? And your U.S. Open would be your best one. You'd still make a million bucks or something crazy like that. So, I mean, pars are, are really good scores, you know, so don't ever underestimate that. So one more, Eric, before I let you go. And, and when we're in between shots, let's say I hit my sand wedge normally around 100 yards, my gap wedge 115. But here I am, I'm 105. I'm sort of right in, in between those two clubs. Many times we either try to muscle up the sand wedge and we end up chunking it or we thin it or, you know, something along those lines because we're, we're in between shots. We desell the club if we take a little higher because we're afraid we're going to fly the green and, and we end up in all kinds of trouble. So for those in-betweeners, what do you teach your students to do in order to hit that shot more successfully? So that's a great question. I mean, you know, I, my twins are 15 years old now and they're on the JV golf team and I Played with him in a tournament uh, for a charity event the other day in a scramble, and we shot ten under by the way, and and finished second. But uh, nice. watching them play, yeah, watching them play golf though it was like I said, boys, you don't know how to play golf. I said, what are you doing? You know, I mean, they they they, and I think this is true with a lot of players. I mean, you know, they they I have never seen anyone have a long sand wedge contest. I've seen them have closest to the pin contest, but. I don't care if you can hit your standards 125, but the problem with it too, even if you do catch it and you're going all out, it spins like crazy and it's going up. So if there's any wind, you get totally destroyed, you know, and the art of hitting little knockdowns. And Chris, this is one of the biggest things that I think I try to keep the backswing consistent. I don't try to make it shorter or longer. And then I try to change the through swing. I have a waist high finish with the head of the club. Shoulder high finish with the head of the club, a rehinge, which is a 90 degree angle, almost full and full. And from there, I swing to an end point and it flights the ball down. And, you know, I always hit it more solid because I'm not jumping out of my shoes and going out of posture. And, and so to me, it's always about changing the through swing and, and where you, where the end point of the golf swing is. So take the, take the, you know, the little, Less lofted club, and then hit an end point, whether it's waist, shoulder, rehinge, almost full, full. That's the way I do it. Eric, I got to get your thoughts on our Steelers before I let you go, because that was a debacle on Sunday night. So I, I, I either need you to talk me off the ledge or go ahead and push me over it, because I don't know what I if I if, if they do that again on Sunday against Seattle, I, it's going to be a long football season for me. You know, if this is what an off season without drama is, maybe I want the drama back. Because my God, that was <laughs> that was one of the worst football games. I, they were out coached. They and it's just the same thing. If you want a blueprint on how to beat the Steelers, just watch that game. Oh my God, everything from the, I mean, Ben looked like he was in an assisted living home, and and you had you had the receivers not catching anything. You had. Tomlin over there, oh, yeah, it's okay. No, it's not okay, Mike. It's not okay. 
Um, <laughs> I, you know, I've got Joe Vincent and the KPMG guys invited me to the Steeler game this week, and and I'm hoping I don't jump off the Clemente Bridge or something after that game. <laughs> like I just, I, you know, just, I, you know, I mean, wow. I mean, no one. It, yeah. It's almost like they just threw in the towel and said, "You know what? They're going to beat the crap out of us. We're just going to just." Uh, oh, and then how about the? You got third and one on the goal line. You're down twenty something points, and you kick a field goal on fourth and one fr- from the one, and you're down <laughs> three scores. You had four scores. I, I, what are you? What are you doing? Just so you didn't get blanked? Come on. I yeah. 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 But that's our nemesis, yeah. you know. It's always that case. Now they've got Antonio Brown, which is even makes me hate him even worse. Right? Oh boy! Yeah, both of them. I hate both of them. Worse. Yeah, I hate them both. Eric, let uh, our list. You know, and, and, and he was Antonio yeah. Brown. I got a picture with my kids down on the field with him. He was a heck of a oh. stellar guy back in the day. And he's got he's turned into a maybe he's yeah. got some mental health issues. I don't know. He's turned crazy. But I mean, he was yeah. so nice to my kids. Big hugs. Hey guys, how you doing? Good to see you. Yeah, he didn't remember who the heck they were, but it was awesome of them. But crazy stuff. I'm hoping yeah. for a good game this Sunday. And I'll be there. I'll be thinking Indeed. about you. <laughs> I appreciate you. Yeah. Eric, let our listeners know how they can stay up to date with all the great things you're doing on your website. And then hopefully one day soon, we're going to get you on social media too. No, oh, man. Everybody keeps bugging me about that. It's Eric Johnson Golf on Facebook, Eric Johnson Golf on Twitter, um, nemacolon.com. Come and see us. Great place. But, uh, you know, Chris, I always appreciate you. Always great to talk with you. I appreciate your time, Eric. Take care, my friend. I'll catch up with you soon. Looking forward to having you back on for a 15th time, hopefully sometime not too distant future. Have a great rest of the show, buddy. Thanks, man. I appreciate you, Eric. That's Eric Johnson. EricJohnsonGolf.com is his website, at Eric Johnson Golf on Twitter and on social media. We need to get him out there a little more often. He doesn't tweet and get on social media often, but uh, he is truly one of the great instructors and just one of the great people you get to meet in this life. All right, folks, before I get to my next guest, Miss Lawrence, I want to tell you about a couple of our sponsors. First, if you haven't hit Ben Hogan Iron since maybe the 80s or the 90s, do yourself a favor and get a demo iron for either their Fort Worth PTX, new PTX Pro, or Edge Irons, and take it out on the range and compare it to whatever it is you've got in your bag. All Ben Hogan Irons and wedges are handcrafted one at a time in their Fort Worth, Texas factory, so no mass production, no shortcuts. Now you can order custom-made irons, wedges, and hybrids by going online to BenHoganGolf.com. And they're going to build those clubs to your specification and, best of all, charge you a fraction of the typical retail price. Again, check out their complete line of forged irons, wedges, utility irons, hybrids, bags, accessories, and their new GS53 driver and fairway woods by going online to BenHoganGolf.com. I want to give a shout-out to our friends over at Golf Pride. In golf, light grip pressure releases power. Golf Pride engineered a secret that pros know. A larger, lower hand encourages lighter pressure. Plus 4 technology is designed with four additional layers, which reduces tension in the lower hand to generate more power. Play Plus 4 and release the secret pros know. Now available on Tour Velvet. The winningest grip on Tour. Grip confidence. Grip Golf Pride. And folks, this segment of the show is sponsored by our good friends over at the PGA Tour Superstore. This segment of the show is brought to you by the PGA Tour Superstore. See why golfers everywhere are proud to call PGA Tour Superstore their golf pro shop. Visit them online at PGATourSuperstore.com. Now back to Chris and more of the show. And now back with me here on the French Lick Resort guest line is Mitch Lawrence. You hear me mention his show, Talking Golf Getaways, every week at the top of the show because... A, I'm a huge Mitchell Lawrence fan, and on top of that, the show is absolutely fantastic. Before you plan a golf trip, pretty much anywhere in the world you want to go, particularly around the U.S. and in Canada, pull up their podcast on GolfTripX.com. That's a letter X, so GolfTripX.com, or you can find it on Audioboom, iTunes, Stitcher, Player.fm. Scroll through the Talking Golf Getaways page and start listening. You, they're going to help you find the perfect spot for you. And if you're saying to yourself, Mitch Lawrence, that name sounds familiar to me. Well, it's probably because you've seen him in, in movies or out on TV. Mitch had roles in TV shows like Santa Barbara, One Tree Hill, Dawson's Creek, L.A. Law, not necessarily the news, Saturday Night Live. He was in movies like The Hand That Rocks the Cradle, plus several made-for-TV movies as well. And beyond all of that, like I say, he is just one of the most fantastic people you're going to get to meet. And I'm very thrilled he's back with me again tonight here on Next on the T. Good evening, Mitch. How are you, my friend? 
after that intro, I'm doing great. Thanks. <laughs> you you are you. you are incredible, my friend. You are incredible. <laughs> I, I appreciate you. So, Mitch, I it's want to start our life. time. I know. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yes, it has. And like I say to you all the time, and folks, I say this to Mitch off the air all the time. It's good to be Mitch Lawrence. There's never a day when it's not good to be Mitch Lawrence. So <laughs> congratulations to you on a wonderful life, as Jimmy Stewart would say. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I want to start our time because you, you recently hosted a wonderful trip at a golf course that not enough people know about, Sweetens Cove, just outside of Chattanooga. So talk about the event that you guys had up there and what the course was like. Um, I'm going to start off by asking you a question. Uh-oh. Before you saw anything that I put up about Sweetens Cove, did you know about it? No, absolutely not. You're the one who introduced me to the okay. course. Glad you did. Well, I wasn't. I wasn't saying. I wasn't saying it because of me, but I think that's the most amazing part about Sweetens Cove, which is that most people don't know about. And, um, you know, I got to a point where I started seeing stuff on social media about it. And so I started kind of following it. It's such a unique and amazing place. And uh, we decided, my partner, Darren Bunch, my podcast partner and Golf Trip X partner, Darren Bunch and Ryan Ballinger from Golf Newsnet, who works with us on Golf Trip X also, uh, we realized after we had done some research and kept hearing about Sweetens that they had come up with uh, an opportunity where you could actually rent the golf course for the day, which is not a chance you get often. And so we talked about it and we thought about it. And uh, for your listeners who, like you, may be unaware of Sweetens, and you're in Atlanta, I know, it is a short drive. It's outside of Chattanooga in a place called South Pittsburgh, Tennessee. Um, And the place is a nine-hole golf course. Most people, when you say that, they go, oh, okay, great. And they dismiss it out of hand. The difference between many nine-hole, and I love nine-hole golf courses. You know me. Uh, But the difference between most and Sweetens is that Rob Collins, who is the architect, and Tad King, who was the head of construction, their partners in King Collins Golf, when they had a chance to uh, get involved in what was a flat nine-hole golf course, literally just a flat piece of land with nine tees and nine greens, they got a chance to go ahead and literally do whatever they wanted. The gentleman who owned the piece of property uh, gave them carte blanche, and they took advantage of it. And when I say took advantage, these nine holes are as good as any nine holes you're likely to play on a regulation golf course anywhere. And so little by little, um, Rob Collins, Tad, and a couple other guys kept it afloat. They built it uh, a number of years ago. And in 2017, a great writer named Dylan DeChair wrote an article in, New- in the New York Times. He took a flyer, went out to see Sweetens said to Rob, I have an idea I want to write about, and I'm going to go to the New York Times. Rob thought he was nuts. He said, I'm going to go. And he wound up writing an article that obviously a lot of people saw. And with that article, people started coming to Sweetens Cove. And that was in 2017. And to give you an idea of how fast this course has risen, and if I said to you that you could play a course that in 2019 was ranked by Golf Week as the 49th ranked modern course in America and the 21st ranked best course you can play in America, would you want to play it? Absolutely. Well, that's what Sweetens Cove is. And that's not for nine-hole courses. That's for all courses. So it's ranked ahead of Valhalla, Quail Hollow, places like that. And when we decided to have this event, we had um, about 25 guys who came and played with us. We took the course for two days. And I can only tell you that it was one of the – I've done a lot of golf travel in my life and a lot of playing at different great courses. Uh, this two days was right up there with the best trips I've taken. And I think anybody who is there would say the same thing. It is a – Absolutely fantastic course. 
The uh, greens are as good and as challenging as any place I've played. The uh, the vibe there is what sets it apart also, incredibly laid back. Uh, so people who go there are surprised by the fact that at this point, the pro shop is basically a shed. It's called The Shed. Um, it's very small. It doesn't have a lot of uh, merchandising and all that kind of stuff. There's a uh, port john out back. They don't have indoor plumbing or anything like that. Um, and part of what makes Sweden special is that's what people wound up loving. What they thought would be a liability turned into what golfers who came there loved, which was just the golf. It wasn't about anything else. And when you go there, that's what you do. So they have nine holes, as I said, obviously. It's not a long court. It only plays 6,600 yards from the back tees. Uh, that'll change a little bit because they added some length to the first tee. But basically, that's the from the back tees and 4,500 from the front tees. Um, and but the the shots are what make this golf course. It's it's pretty generous off the tee, but the greens are off the charts, Chris. They are off the charts. They are giant greens, a lot of slope, a lot of subtlety. Uh, and what they, another thing they've done, which really impressed everybody that was there. They, uh, Zach Blair, who you know, who's going to be playing on the PGA Tour, had done an event called right. The Ringer there. And they got a bunch of guys there, and they had, had been throwing around the ideas of putting two flags on every green. That's how big these greens are. And they wow. tried it at The Ringer. Everybody loved it. And so they have two two flags on every green. So when you play the first nine, you play to one flag. And then when you play the second nine, you play to the other flag. And to give you an idea of how much that can change your round, the the only hole that's named at Sweden's is the fourth hole. It's a par three. It's called the King. And that's kind of a long story why it was named the King, not after Arnold Palmer, whose birthday it is today. Happy birthday, Arnie. Uh, but based on a guy who helped Rob Collins get involved in the project. This green is big enough where... In the morning round, the first time we played it, we had a shot that was about 90 yards to a front right pin. And in the afternoon, the back left pin was 170 yards. Oh, my. On the same green. Wow. And needless to say, the hole plays completely differently, as does every hole when you play to the different pins. So we had we had a phenomenal time. We played... Uh, played our own ball a number of times. We played a hickory nine-hole scramble where everybody played hickories, which was obviously for me and Darren and Brian Orr, our photographer, who play hickories. It was fantastic. Uh, a couple, a bunch of people went out. In the last nine they played, and they played cross country. You know, they have a course there that they, Sweetens kind of sets up and gives you an opportunity to play shots from one hole to a whole other hole. And so you you really can mix it up. People played barefoot. Um, we oh played eight some. We played eight sums. We played. We just had one of those trips where it's what the game is about. Literally, it's about fun. It's about the challenge. It's about being with people who love the game as much as you do. And um, there are obviously a bunch of great places we all play. But uh, it'd be you'd be hard pressed to find a place. That gives you more of an opportunity than Sweden's Cove does. So uh, it was a great event, and I hope people, like I said, especially drivable. Uh, if you're in Atlanta or any any place really in the South, you can hop in your car and be there in not too much time. And there was a guy, one guy took his son and drove five hours just to play nine holes, and then went back. So wow, that shows you the kind of place it is. Yeah. So, Mitch. Some of the other places that I want to get into tonight are up in Michigan. You've done some trips, and I think you've done another one here just recently, going up to the mm -hmm. northern part of the state of Michigan, really out there on the peninsula itself. Um, talk about Mackinac Island and the northern part of uh, the Michigan Peninsula and the beautiful golf courses. We don't often equate beautiful golf to northern Michigan, but, boy, they sure do have a lot of great golf courses up there. Well, I think one of the things about Michigan and the whole state of Michigan is it's one of the most golf-rich states that we have. Uh, and granted, the season is short because of the winter, but if you can get up there in the fall 
or the spring of the summer, it's mind boggling how much great golf is up there. Last summer I was with the, I went up and played uh, some of the courses on the Boyne golf trail, really. Um, and those courses are unbelievable. Uh, and then this summer I had a chance to go up. It started because I was asked to play in the U.S. Hickory Open, which was in a place called Charlevoix, Michigan, on the West Coast, up in the Upper Peninsula. And a good friend of mine, Kevin Frisch, who's the PR guy for uh, pretty much for all of golf in Michigan, uh, knew I was a Hickory guy and asked if I wanted to go up and play at Belvedere. And that's where the trip started. And I'm going to mention that to your listeners in case they get a chance to get up there. There's still time in the fall. The next couple of months are really, really beautiful up there, obviously, with the changing colors and everything. Belvedere is a historic course. It was built and opened in 1927. Um, and it had, it's a private club, but it was completely restored to the original design a couple of years ago. And it's one of the great clubs in America. The history at Belvedere is off the chart. I mean, literally off the charts. Uh, the people who have played there, I'm just going to read this list, which I really, when I, when I saw it, when I was trying to decide whether I would go and play, um, it kind of blew my mind. Uh, Bobby Jones, Walter Hagen, Sarazen, uh, that list goes on and on. Sneed, Tom Watson went there, and it was his home course every summer growing up. So wow. you can imagine what that place is like. Fantastic, fantastic golf. And the membership is off the charts welcoming. That From the head pro, a guy named Marty Joy, his whole staff, and the membership, uh, it's open to guests. If you get in touch with Belvedere and you say, I want to come play the course, they welcome you, even though it's a private club. So. That's my first recommendation. If you can get to Belvedere, do it. Uh, then uh, I met my wife, Ava, and two great friends of ours who live in Michigan, Bob and Vicki Paskey. They met me up in Traverse City. Uh, and in, No, I'm sorry, Mackinac City, which is just across the water from Mackinac Island. Um, are you, were you aware of Mackinac Island? Have you heard about Mackinac Island? I was Island? not. No, not until I listened to the podcast. Yeah, Mackinac is, I'd been aware of it because there was a movie called Somewhere in Time. People who are older may remember it. Christopher Reeve was in it and Jane Seymour. And it was all about this place called the Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island. And so I knew about it for a long time. And we got a chance to stay at the Grand Hotel. You go to Mackinac City. You have to take a ferry over to Mackinac Island because there's no cars. So the first part of this is you get to Mackinac. It is a fantastic old world environment. It's like you've literally stepped back in time. And then we went up to the Grand Hotel, which is, as the name implies, one of the great hotels in the world, not just America. Uh, it, you know, a century old, it's, it's got all kinds of history involved. So we got to stay there, which was a treat. Uh, they have two nine hole golf courses at Mackinac at the Grand Hotel. Together, they're called the Jewel. And the, the first nine is called the Grand, and that's right by the hotel. Uh, one of the things that, that we loved about it is when you get off the ferry, you notice two things, bicycles and horse-drawn carriages, which is the only way you can get around on the island. So you kind of have a feeling of what you're, what you're in for. But the Grand is a great nine-hole course. It was done uh, by a guy named Jerry Matthews. It was built in 1987. Um, the course itself, that nine holes, dated back to 1901. 1901. Wow. They had a golf course there. Uh, but Jerry Matthews redid it in 1987, and it's a great, great golf course. It's incredibly landscaped, a lot of elevation change, small, tough greens, so it's a challenge. But it's really fun for everybody to play. And from three or four holes, you get to see the hotel above you, and uh, the, the views are just off the charts. You get to see the Straits of Mackinac, and beautiful experience. So then the other nine is called The Woods. That was built later by Jerry Matthews. We didn't get to play that one. That's kind of an inland course. But what we did get to do, based on the recommendations of some other Hickory friends of mine, was visit a place called Wawashkamo Golf Club. It's a half-hour horse-drawn carriage ride from the Grand Hotel wow. to get to this golf course. And through the woods, and you're just uh, – that experience alone is incredible. And then you get to Awashkamo, and Awashkamo, I, I could talk about this for an hour, but I won't. Um, it was built in 1898 by a guy named Alex Smith. And if you're not familiar with the history of the Smith brothers who came from Scotland, Alex Smith 
designed this nine holes in 1898, and then went on to win the U.S. Open in 1906 and 1910. So this is a this is a, a major figure in the history of golf. These nine holes are built on the site of one of the battles, the Battle of Mackinac Island, uh, that took place during the Battle of the War of 1812 between the British and the Americans. So the the history of the club and the history of the War of 1812 are mixed throughout the course. Um, you start by the clubhouse up on the first tee. There's a cannon from the War of 1812. And then you tee off, and the course has been, and this is what I loved about it, remarkably unchanged. It has not been redone at all. So for those people who want that kind of experience, um, I have never played anything like it. I really have not. And obviously, I was out there with my hickories. My friend Bob that I played with had his modern clubs. But the greens are small. Uh, the bunkers are kind of weird. There's ridiculously unique holes. There's one hole. You would love this. It's called the Circle Ring, and it's a short par four, and it's got knee-high heather around the entire green except for about a three-foot opening in the front of the green. Literally, knee-high wow. heather all the way around the green. So you have to hit a shot that comes pretty much straight down. But the whole course is has got that kind of feel, and the, the uh, general manager and head pro is a guy named Chuck Olson, and he and his wife – take care of the club, and they've preserved the history. They have a, a huge hickory tournament every year. And if you get up to Mackinac, you want to play the grand courses, but if you can get to Awashkamo, um, it's literally an experience you'll never forget. It's unlike anything I've ever done. Wow. That and then, if I can quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you would love it. And I'm telling you, if you're with, if you just go up there with friends and you just spend an afternoon, um, and again, they – Alex Smith did a really cool thing because it's only nine holes. He created different tee boxes on every hole. So when you play the first nine, you play from one set of tees. Then when you play the second nine, you play from a whole other set of tees that gives you different yardages and different angles into the greens. So it's, wow. there's no part of it that is anything but really, really interesting. And then to finish up a great trip, um, we, my wife and Bob and Vicky and I got to go down to Forest Dunes which is a couple hour drive. And I don't know if you're familiar with forest dunes and what they have up there, but it's one of the great, uh, about to be, if not already booming destinations in Michigan. It's in a out of the way place called Ross common, Michigan. Uh, the original course was designed by Tom Weisskopf and it's a beauty. We didn't get to play it, but we saw some of the holes. Everybody I talked to loved the golf course, but we did get to play a, a pretty revolutionary course, which Tom Doak designed called the Loop. Uh, and more people have probably heard about that than a place like, um, you know, Wawashkamo, I, I would assume, or even Belvedere. But the Loop is an 18-hole reversible golf course. So you play the first day, we played counterclockwise. The next morning, we went out and played clockwise. And so wow. you've got a chance to play into greens from completely different parts of the golf course on the same 18 holes. Um, and it's brilliant. I had no idea what to expect. I'd read a lot about it. I know a lot about Tom Doak. I knew this was an idea he'd wanted to do for a long time. Uh, and he pulled it off. It is one of the most enjoyable, challenging, fun golf experiences you can have. And for those of your listeners that love Scottish-style golf, Lynx golf, this is as much a Scottish style course as you'll ever find in the middle of Michigan. It's got all fescue grass on the fairway, so the ball runs forever. Um, and the greens are a bent mix, but they feel like you're putting on kind of Scottish greens. Um, it's a, it's a brilliant, brilliant work by Tom Doak. I can't recommend it highly enough. Great staff. And like I said, you've got a Weisskopf course, the loop, and I got a chance to hang for a while. Uh, with Keith Reb and Riley Johns, two architects who built Winter Park, the Winter Park Nine Hole Golf Course, which has gotten a lot of praise from a lot of people and which I love. Uh, and they're building a 10 hole short course at Forest Tunes, which you would absolutely freak out, would you see? It's yeah. 10 par threes, 10 par threes. And their whole mission is to build a golf course, a par three golf course, that if you wanted to, you could play with a putter if you want. Wow. Interesting concept. 
Yeah. So the holes are 55 to 110 yards about. Um, but the facility is off the charts. The villas are great. They have a top tier restaurant in the lodge. Uh, there's, I think they have 12 rooms you can stay in at the actual clubhouse. It's Forest Dunes. It was, it was a great end to what was a really, really memorable trip to Michigan. So, Mitch, for all of our listeners now that are dying to get more information and to hear more about and read more about all of this, tell them how they can do it. Well, um, as you said, I think one great way is to go to GolfTripX.com. Um, and they can get – we have a lot of information about Michigan. We've all – everybody in the team has been there a number of times. So we've got a lot of information that people can find, podcasts and blogs about where you can go and what you can do. I think that's a great place to go. Um, and, and I would say that's it. That's the place to start. Um, Kevin and Frisch how can PR. they follow you on social media? Uh, you can go to <laughs> kevinfrischpr.com, which is uh, <laughs> Kevin's the guy who is the man. He has a lot of information about that. There's great, great places. You can go to boingolf.com. Um, obviously, each one of those places has their own websites, Forest Dunes, uh, Belvedere, and uh, Mackinac Island. You can get all the info on their website, too. So I can't, uh, again, we're so lucky to have all the places that we have to play uh, in this country. And, and like I said, I hadn't been to Michigan to really play golf till last summer. And in the last two summers, um, I'm as big a fan of Michigan golf as you'll ever find. Let our listeners know as well, Mitch, how they can stay up to date with all the great things that you're doing and where you're going by following you on social media as well. Well, that's pretty simple. At Mitch Lawrence, L-A-U-R-A-N-C-E on Twitter and Instagram. And uh, I'm pretty regular about putting up what we're doing. And and I can't thank you enough for, for you know, just having me on and, and letting me talk about these places that I love and the travel and that's the thing about golf. It's the greatest game because we can do all of it. Well, Mitch, it's always so much fun having you as part of the show. I can't thank you enough for being generous with your time and coming back. I hope it won't be long before you do it again because you're always going well, to great places, that. and I love your stories. Well, thanks, man. I love talking to you. You know that, Chris. No, I appreciate you, Mitch. Take care, my friend. All the best to you, Ava, and the rest of your family. Look forward to catching up soon. Thank you. You too, man. Bye. That's a great Mitch Lawrence, at Mitch Lawrence, L-A-U-R-A-N-C-E is how he spells the last name, and it's fantastic. Golf Trip X, the letter X dot com, so Golf Trip X dot com. So many great podcasts, so many great courses that they talk about. I can't wait to get up to Sweden's Cove. I hope they do that trip again next year. I don't know if they will or not because there's so many other places I'm sure that he and Darren want to go and, and feature and have people come to, but... um uh, it looks fantastic online. I, you know, there's really no reason why I haven't gone up there to play. It's only a couple hours from here, so I got to make that happen. But uh, Mitch is fantastic. One of the great people you meet in this life, and uh, very fortunate to call him a friend. And I look forward to catching up with him again real soon. All right, before I get to my next guest, Paul Grandgard, I want to give a quick shout out to our friends over at Positive Vibes Golf. Check them out online at positivevibesgolf.com and follow them on Twitter at pvibesgolf. Their head covers and putter covers are a unique way to keep your mind focused on positive thoughts. They're a great on-course training aid as well because they help you stay positive by putting positive, happy images in your mind. Every time you walk back to your golf bag, you're going to see the head cover. It's going to put a smile on your face. It's going to lessen the tension and really enjoy your round of golf because that's what it's all about. Just like Mitch just said, it's about having fun. Check them out online again at PositiveVibesGolf.com. I want to welcome our newest sponsor, Two Under Men's Performance Briefs, the unofficial underwear of the PGA Tour. Worn by PGA Tour players like Ricky Fowler, David Toms, Jerry Kelly, William McGirt, Jason Kokrak, and Matt Everett, to name just a few. Your buddies are going to think you're a stud if they're even seeing you in your underwear, but that's another story. And your girlfriend and her wife is going to love the side effects, a visibly enhanced profile. The Joey Pouch technology provides the ultimate male asset management. It separates a man's most valuable assets from bodily contact to reduce unwanted skin-on-skin contact, providing less chafing, more control, and an altogether more luxurious feel. Start every round two under by wearing the coolest performance briefs on the market. Use code ONTHET20 to save 20% off your order at twounder.com. 
And that's the number two, UNDR.com. All right. Now back with me on the French Lake Resort guest line is Paul Grandgard. Paul has been one of my favorite guests over the years. We all got to know him when he was the CEO of Allen Edmonds Shoes. He saved that great American company from going bankrupt several years ago. He is now the founder and CEO of Circle Rock, which is a wonderful new uh, men's clothing line featuring custom made in the USA suits and shirts and, and sweaters, finely woven sweaters, which look absolutely fantastic. European style outerwear, some very cool gifts that uh, you've heard me talk about on the show before. Go online to check it out yourself at circlerock.com. See what I'm talking about. It all looks absolutely outstanding, and I'm so excited that Paul is back with me again tonight here on Next on the T. Good evening, Paul. How are you, my friend? Hello, Chris. I'm well, my friend. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, sir. So, Good. Paul. Let's go to Michigan. For, yeah, right? Do you hear, Mitch? Yeah, I mean, I, was... played, I, 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 I have not uh, played golf in Michigan, but it sounds fantastic. Well, I, you know, Alan Edmonds is on the other side of Lake Michigan, and I spent nine years working there with the plant is right on the shore and uh, Lake Michigan is an amazing body of water. One day it looks like a mean Atlantic Ocean, another day it looks like a northern Wisconsin lake, nice and smooth, like you could water ski on it. And I can just imagine on the other side where all there are all those sand dunes, as Mitch is describing, the uh the kind of golf course that you can build with the lake right there and the sand dunes, it's gotta be amazing. Really, really something to see, I'm sure. I haven't been there myself, but he makes it sound like we got to go. Indeed. So, yeah. Paul, I, I, I want to get your thoughts. You know, for, for those folks that, that weren't with us last time, and, and you've built this wonderful new brand, Circle Rock, talk about the things that you do and what sets your brand apart from all the rest. Well, it starts with Made in USA. Less than 3% of the clothing that's bought in the United States these days was made in this country. We really led over the last 20 to 30 years an entire industry, not just the final product, the uh, manufacturers, but also the supply chain that went into it go completely overseas. It, it uh, traumatized a lot of communities around the country, particularly in the Northeast and in Carolinas, where the fabric industry was, and and so those who survived, that last three percent is made by people who had to be absolutely terrific to hang in there. Um, and so we work with artisans like that who know really how to make fantastic stuff, and and they're in places that really need the job. Um, my wife and I just dropped our daughter off in Washington D.C. and decided we would drive back uh, along the U.S. highways instead of along the interstate highways, Kentucky and Indiana and Illinois, Iowa, up to Minnesota, where we live. And we went through some really great towns with gorgeous county seats, buildings, town halls, and, and just the uh, main street all boarded up. And it just really shows, you know, not only, we talk in the Midwest about how the Midwest is flying over country and the people concentrated on the coast you know, tend to fly from one side of the country to the other and just uh, look down at us from 35,000 feet. Well, it's also a little bit true when people drive now on the interstate. You don't go through towns. You just whip along. You see the cornfields maybe, but uh, you don't realize uh, what's going on in those towns. And we really need to support uh, these communities and these manufacturers, and it's worth it. They make great stuff. It's not like we're taking a step back when we do. So that's that's number one is made in USA. Number two is um, price value. We have taken a chunk of the margin out of our pricing because we go directly from the producers to uh, the customer. We're not going through a major retailer with big mall leases and exclusive physical uh, stores. We're, we've got our a physical store that we just opened up, but it's, it's in a neighborhood. It's got uh, some really kind of quaint quirkiness to it, and frankly, it's less expensive. So we give this really high-quality product made in the USA for a much lower price than you'd pay for any kind of similar quality from Italy or you know from those luxury brands that did ship their production off to Asia years ago. So that's number two. And then number three is um, you know, I'm really concerned about the 
dialogue in the country today about uh, just our psyche uh, in this country. And, and I'm wondering who's inspiring us to be the best of who we can be. And certainly your listeners in the armed services deserve everybody's great respect. And you know, they inspire us. But you pick up a paper today and you read about, you know, yet another hashtag me too offender and, uh, and just, uh, you know, a lot of the negative stuff in the press. And, and I am fully aware and I know a ton of really good men doing really good work for their companies, for their families, for their communities. And we want to highlight those people. We want to build our brand around those people. And, uh, we also want to talk about them. And if you go on our website, you'll see some interviews with some really impressive uh, men with a lot of uh, a lot of wisdom to offer. So uh, that's part of our brand too. Is just exactly who we're about. Who who are our customers? Who's inspiring us? And and uh, who are the people we want to inspire? Inspire also. So there are a couple of things there that I that I want to get into a little bit deeper, Paul. Let's first stick with the fact that everything you guys do is here in the U.S. And I read on your website, again, at CircleRock.com, it says that in order to make the finest sweaters in the world, we had to go down the road to Winona, Minnesota. Talk about Winona, yeah. Minnesota. Well, it's one of those communities. Fortunately, Winona has uh, Winona State University there and another major college. And um uh, it's far enough away from the Twin Cities that it's been able to keep its nucleus of companies. There are a couple of great companies headquartered there, one of which is known uh, pretty well around the country as Fastenal. And the owner and founder of Fastenal has been really generous to that community. They have a, a great arts program there. They've got a Renoir in their art museum. They've got, uh, they do a Beethoven festival in the summer. So Winona is right on the Mississippi River. It's one of the own, oldest communities in what was once called the Great Northwest, uh, when the Mississippi was, you know, the main artery going down the middle of the country and, and the railroads were heading west out to the forests and, and the, the lumber out in the Pacific Northwest. So, uh, Winona is a great town and our manufacturer there has been in business 60 years and it's a German immigrant who's now 80 years old who runs it. His name's Bernie Brenner. And Bernie has an amazing story to tell about being five or six years old when Patton's army came into Third Army, came into his town and liberated it in um, 1945 uh, near Stuttgart, Germany. And uh, the, he was aware that the adults in town were so relieved that it was the Americans who came to liberate their town that they got there before the Russians did coming from the other side. They had heard what was going on in the eastern part of Germany and in Czechoslovakia and, and uh, Austria. They they just didn't, didn't want to be uh, liberated, quote unquote, by the Russians. And the Americans brought their bubble gum and uh, were friendly with the kids and uh, kind to the people and, and just brought a, a whole sense of relief and uh you know, there's still a future ahead of us um, feeling to that town. And he said at that age, I want to be an American someday. He came to this country first as a salesman for the highest quality knitting machines in the country. And, you know, the Germans in the, or in the world, and you know, the Germans in their engineering. So in their uh, manufacturing machinery. So he was representing them and he got here and uh, he said, I'm going to stay. And he told his boss in Germany, I'm going to buy some of our own equipment and I'm going to start a company. And he landed in Winona, Minnesota. And of course, he met a Minnesota girl and they got married, been married now for probably uh, 55, 50 years. And they've got kids who have grown up and have grandchildren. He has that eye of a German engineer for quality and for attention to the detail that you can't imagine. And he's never wavered. He uh, has always kept those really high standards. He didn't try to compete with Asia production by going down quality. So the stitching, the knitting, the borders between uh, the zipper and the sweater and a quarter zip sweater, uh, these things are all immaculately done. He says, and anybody out there is listening and knows about manufacturing, you always have tolerances in manufacturing. He says, we don't have tolerances here. If you have tolerances, that means you're not serious about 
perfection. And although it's still something we're working on, he's 80 years old, uh, he likes to say that um, they're going after perfection. And um, you can tell that in the sweaters that he makes. So we're thrilled that he's willing to partner with us. We sell them under our brand, Circle Rock. And um, I wear these sweaters. I get comments on them all the time. We sold them at a couple of golf courses uh, at their holiday uh boutiques that they held last year and uh, they flew off the shelves because people love them. That's one of the challenges we found in our business. You know, I started off last year when you and I talked trying to be an internet only company and you really have to see, touch and feel the quality of our products. And so we've opened a store where people can do that now. And we hope that then leads to word of mouth, reviews online and and, uh, people trusting us uh, a little more because you just, you can't quite see how, Incredible this stuff is when you look at it on on a photograph online. So let's 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 take that to the next step because I you know people that are just learning about Circle Rock and just hearing about you know your company whether maybe it's for the first time or we're refreshing their memories from the last time that you were a part of the show. You talk about the sweaters because I've looked online yeah. many times and the quarter zip and the V neck sweaters look outstanding. We're he- getting ready to head into in the fall, some parts of the country, I'm sure, up in, in Minnesota and Michigan, they're starting to feel fall in the air. Those of us in the south are wishing for fall. But talk about yeah. what you have available and and what what uh, you know, whether it's the 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 V-neck sweater is what is the quarter knit uh, quarter zip, whether it's the sweater vest that you have, which I've got my eye on because for those of us who still like to play golf when it starts to get cold outside. And don't like to be all jammed up in a jacket and, and, you know, feel our, our swings get a little more restricted. Those sweater vests look great for that. Talk about what you have to offer. Yeah. Well, we want to be known as, as the company for the smarter looking vest. You know, you, uh, the vest look is all over corporate America today from September through April, uh, generally and, um, particularly in the colder climate. It's it's become a sport coat replacement, and the sport coat was a suit replacement. So we moved from coat and tie in a suit to sport coats with open collar to where now a lot of guys are wearing a uh, vest with a nice shirt underneath it. And one thing about men and business casuals, it's not very well defined for them, and a lot of guys uh, don't really quite understand it. And you can see that when you're Walking through business centers in America, there are a bunch of guys who who think they're dressing for their their peers and forgetting that their peers don't give them promotions. It's not your 28 year old friend or your 33 year old friend who's who's still dressing the way both you both of you did in college. Who's going to decide whether you're the, you're going to get the next promotion? It's actually somebody up the ladder. How does that guy dress? And how's the guy above him dress or her? And, uh, you gotta think about that. So, um, and by the way, there have been studies done that how you present yourself makes a huge impact on people. It's usually subconscious, but it's real and it matters. So, you know, if you're in a career where everybody your age is wearing a hoodie sweatshirt, I wouldn't wear a hoodie sweatshirt because it's probably not what the uh, person who runs the firm is wearing. And you want to dress for the job you want not for the job you have, is one of the rules of of dressing. So these vests now, a lot of guys are wearing uh, vests that are are better suited to doing something outside rather than working in the office and presenting to your best client or to somebody up the chain. So uh, we want to help guys pick higher quality vests, not something you'd wear on a hiking trip, not something you'd wear to sweat in, but um, something you'd wear to impress your clients or impress a woman uh, at the bar uh, in the evening. So these things are sweaters. We also have vests now that are made out of beautiful woolen sport coat fabric that um, that are made in the outer islands of the Herbides in Scotland. And, you know, we all love Scotland and the golfing world. I was just there again this summer and walked up and down the uh, St. Andrews, I had back surgery, so I wasn't able to play, but uh, I stood there longingly and looked at the course. These fabrics from Scotland are made in cottages all around these islands on off the uh, northwest coast of Scotland near the Isle of Skye. 
and they're just gorgeous. And you put one of those into a vest, no sleeves. You wear a, a shirt that that complements it well, complements it well, and uh, you'll blow the opposite sex and your uh, your colleagues away with uh, how sharp you look. So that's something we're really focused on. We also do great sport coats. Uh, we do uh, in the in the sweater. We have something we call a swacket, which is you know the the sport coat motif is changing these days and we've come up with a sport coat that's actually knit like a sweater so it hangs really casually it feels great it, it breathes because of all the space between the the way things are knit together um, it's, it's not hot at all and uh, it's, it's really a fantastic garment and they're just coming on the market and we've got them and uh, then back to Main USA we worked with a supplier in Brooklyn to come up with this fabulous jacket that we call the uh, the Rosso jacket, named after one of the famous hockey towns in northern Minnesota. Um, this thing it comes in a, a beautiful olive green or a dark navy, and uh, I was told by many experts in the industry, this is one of the things I love about our company and what we're trying to do. I was told by many experts in the industry, if you want to get something like that, with that fine stitching, with the quality and with the touches of leather uh, linings in certain spots and around the collar, you can't do that here. That capability has left America. You can only get it done in Asia now and uh, or for a ton of money in Italy. And I said, I don't believe that. And I went to a flyer we knew, and he said, I'll take it on as a huge challenge. And wow. He really nailed it, knocked the cover off the ball. 330-yard drive down the middle, Chris. It's, <laughs> it's really something. That's awesome. So, yeah. Paul, so there's a couple other things about the shirts. And, and first of all, when I look at your dress and your casual shirts, one of the things it says is they're made 100% cotton chambray. Talk about what chambray is. Chambray is, uh, there are two kinds of um really sharp looking cotton that uh, are a little more casual. Um, one is Oxford cloth, which is woven or, uh, you know, it's, it's put together with thicker threads than you sh usually see in a dress shirt. It's your classic old, you know, back in the days when people wore preppy outfits, that's the Oxford cloth shirt. And um, over the years, people have made a ton of money betting on the idea that Americans don't pay much attention to quality. And so the quality of that Oxford cloth has gotten thinner and thinner over time. You wear through the elbows really quickly. I know that from firsthand early in my career, I wore nothing but these Oxford cloth shirts. It's, you know, it's your classic button down shirt. And, and, uh, I didn't realize it, but I was sitting at a meeting with all the higher ups, the partners in our firm. And one of them lifted my uh, arm up and pointed my elbow at our boss and said, you know, if this isn't an indication that we need to raise our base salaries, I don't know what is because my elbow was <laughs> four inches through my, uh, my cheaper Oxford cloth shirt. So we've gone back to get the really high quality Oxford cloth shirt and, um, they're, they're Georgia cotton. It's an American cotton and they're made in this small town in North Carolina, Garland, North Carolina, where the company employs more people than the population of the town. So you can imagine how important that factory is to that town and, and the area around it. Um, so that's one of them. A chambray shirt is, uh, you know, the kind of shirt that you see out west a lot. It's, it's that sky blue, uh, it's, it's a feeling similar to Oxford cloth, but it's, it's really, um, I think it's one of the most comfortable fabrics. It's it's more casual, no question about that, than than pinpoint uh, cloth, broadcloth shirts or Oxford cloth shirts. But it's um it's something you can wear again. Back to this vest idea, you wear the right color chambray with a cool vest, and uh, you're you're nailing it. it. They look great. So they tend to come in colors like blue, black. Sometimes they're done with mother of pearl buttons and a, and a uh, sort of cowboy pocket on each side. Sometimes they're done more with a 
a brown button uh, flow, which is how we're doing them these days, dark brown button flow, which you know, you know, brings out a little bit of the Western feel to them. So, you know, I, I went to college out west. We're sort of on the edge of it here uh, in Minnesota. My wife and I are about to drive out to Yellowstone in a week and stop at Sand Hills and try to see if my back can play some golf on the way, talking about fescue fairways. Uh, and um, I'm going to get a chambray shirt and wear it out there because that's where they look great. And, Paul, when, when you buy your shirt, you can choose not only your exact sleeve and neck size, none of this, 32, 33, or, or whatnot for your sleeve size. But you can also customize what color you like, the cuff style you want, if you want a pocket or no pocket, color of the buttons, you know, what color the thread yeah. is going to be for those buttons. You can completely customize the shirt for how you want it. Talk about that. Yeah, you know, with, with the demise of the necktie, shirts now look kind of plain up front. And, you know, we all like having our collar open, but... Uh, Especially if you're, uh, you know, uh, want, again, wanting to impress a little more. You know, that row of buttons is an opportunity to show some style, show some some personality uh, in a way that you might have with how you selected your ties in the old days. So, you know, a, a blue checked shirt, what's called the a gingham shirt, or uh, which is a you know a check shirt, or a shirt with a tatter sole, which is a a wider check shirt or uh, a striped shirt, can, you can really pull out the color of pattern by t matching the button to one of the colors in the pattern rather than just having white buttons as you would have in the old days. Similarly, similarly you can accent the button by choosing a different color for the buttonhole or for the thread that holds the button onto the, onto the shirt. So there are a bunch of ways to play your your look and uh, ways to make it unique to you rather than just be the same as uh, same you know and these shirts are pretty common now people are all wearing them so it's possible you wear the exact same shirt as somebody else if you don't do something custom so you know one guy likes a pocket another guy doesn't want a pocket one guy likes the little extra flap that goes down the front. Uh, it's called a placket on on the button row. Another guy likes that just goes smoothly over to to the buttons and the buttonholes and and not have that extra ribbing along the way. So no placket. Uh, some guys like cuffs with two buttons north to south. Uh, other guys don't want two buttons on their uh, coat. They just want one or on their cuff. So. We let you choose all of that stuff, so it's really your own shirt, and we don't charge extra for any of those touches, which is completely unusual, unique in in the industry. Everybody says, "Sure, you can customize. It's five dollars for that. It's twenty bucks for this." Now, for us, it's that's the cost of the shirt, and we'll make it the way you like. Paul, for for our listeners now that are dying to go out there and see all the great stuff that you have, talk about your website and how they can stay up to date with all the wonderful products and the things that you guys have available. Well, the website is, is simply circlerock.com, and if I can, I'll tell you uh, real quick how we came up with that name. I grew up on a street when I was a kid that had a – we were at the e edge of a circle, and it was one-eighth of a mile around the pavement, and in the inside was all grass. It was unofficial park. It's where I first learned to play ball. Uh, the older kids taught the younger kids how to play games, and um, it was really where the community came together. And there was this big rock in it in the northwest quadrant. Uh, it was not smack dab in the middle, which was one of my curiosities. And I always wondered, where did this rock come from? Why did they leave it here? If it was here naturally, why weren't there more? And there was only one when we moved into this house, and I didn't leave it until I went to college at age 18. So I spent a lot of time looking at that rock, wondering how it got there. And uh, I think curiosity is a big hallmark of our country and what makes us special. Our creativity is what sets us apart from other countries in terms of our economy. That's innovation is what makes us great uh, in so many ways here in this country. And that all starts with trying to solve problems and wondering about the world. And I can't even remember how old I was when I first wondered where this rock was. But the other thing was the community coming together in circle. Every summer we had a circle picnic 
as I mentioned, we played all sorts of neighborhood games there. Um, it brought us all together, and that's what we're trying to do with this content side of our company. So um, CircleRock.com, sign up for our mailing list. Every week we send out interesting information. Uh, this week we talked about the origin of the curveball. As much as I love baseball, I didn't realize that for the first 50 years of baseball, uh, the pitcher's job was really just to throw the ball over the plate and let the hitter hit it and the fielders field it. There was no big attempt to strike people out until somebody started putting some juice on the ball. So uh, the origin of the curveball was an article that we did this week. We've also done articles about heroes in, in uh, the armed services. We've done articles about uh, things you ought to think about. Uh, another one recently was you know, 100 great places to visit in the world that you maybe never heard of. Um, so we add that to our content about, you know, how to dress and what we're uh, featuring this week among our product lines. So you can get on our mailing list. Love to have you. We've got about 10,000 people now on our mailing list, and we want to keep that growing. And um, also, uh, when I say mailing list, I mean our email mailing list, and, and we're starting to send out catalogs. So we'd love to have your name and address. And we're often every uh, these chambray shirts you mentioned and the Oxford class shirts. We want to get them out in people's hands. We want people to get familiar with the brand, so we're selling them for unbelievably low prices right now, not very much above our cost. Uh, somebody's got to pay for the light build, so, so there there is a small profit in there. But um, I'll tell you, it, they're an unbelievable value at the price we're selling for right now. So buy a shirt and see how you like it. See it compare it to what you might get at the mall at one of the big brands that you know and uh, what you would pay for a high-quality shirt like that and and uh, see what you think. Well, Paul, it's it's always a privilege to get to spend some time with you and, and learn about the things that you're doing, whether it was back in the day when I first met you at Allen Edmonds or, or now with Circle Rock, the things that you do from a community standpoint that kind of the glue in a lot of these communities, you mentioned the one, up in North Carolina where there are more people that are employed than that live in the city. Those are wonderful stories, and it's fantastic that when, uh, as you talked about at the top, you know, only 3% of the man, uh, clothes manufactured are actually done here in the U.S., and one of your main things is to stay here and be made in the USA. It's a wonderful story. You do a great job, and I can't thank you enough for continuing to come back and educating us on the great things that you're doing and the great products that you have and then uh, what you're doing around the country to keep jobs here in the USA. It's all fantastic. Chris, it's such an honor and a privilege to, to be on your show, and, and knowing who your audience is, it's just uh, I, I want to thank them all for their service to our country, and I, I want to tell you those are the real heroes. So uh, thank you for your nice words, but uh, yeah, I really consider this a major privilege to be able to be on your show. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Paul. Take care, my friend. Look forward to catching up with you again soon. In between now and then, all the best to you and your family. Okay, you too, Chris. Thanks very much. Thanks, Paul. That's Paul Grandgard. And uh, like I say, uh, the the things that he has done for the Allen Edmonds Company and now for Circle Rock, keeping manufacturing jobs right here in the U.S. and making great products with high quality. Now, let's, let's start there, right? When, when, when you heard about the, you know, the story with his shirt and the, and the poor quality and the tearing at the elbows and that sort of thing, we're not talking about shirts that you're going to go to Walmart or Target or, or, you know, places like that to buy. These are high quality, beautiful shirts. And like I say, when, when I peruse circlerock.com and take a look at their dress shirts, their casual shirts, the, the vests are fantastic. And again, for, for those of us that are jonesing for fall, Right. And for those of us in parts of the country that are getting a taste, go out there and take a look at those sweater vests because you're going to continue to play golf as it gets a little bit colder and colder throughout the rest of late summer and into fall. Right. And if you're like me and you don't like the restriction of all the layers and the, and you know, all that around you, your shoulders when you're trying to make the turn and that sort of thing, you really want a nice comfortable vest to have on to play. Fantastic stuff on circlerock.com with their vest. And uh, like I say, the opportunity to completely customize your shirt, like Paul talked about, whether you like the placard or not, or one button or two buttons or different color buttons or all of the different things that you can customize at no additional cost on top. Fantastic stuff, folks. So, uh, again, CircleRock.com 
is is the place. Paul Grandgard is the guy, and uh, he's been a wonderful friend, you know, for the last several years. And really looking forward to continuing to catch up to hear how that brand grows and grows and grows. All right, folks, it is time for me to put a bow on this episode of Next on the T. My sincere thanks go out again to Eric Johnson, Mitch Lawrence, and Paul Grandgard for joining me tonight. Please uh, check out our website, nextonthetea.net, to keep up to date with who are you know who we got coming on, what our guest schedule looks like. Please also check us out all over the net. If if you've got a place that you love listening to podcasts, you're going to find us everywhere. Podbean, our great friends there for featuring the show right there on their app. Can't thank those guys enough. Launchpad.com that's picked up the show. Please uh, click subscribe right there when you go on that site for our show. We really appreciate the fact that people are more and more people are subscribing. It means a great deal to us as well. But you can also find us on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Audioboom, Player.fm. We're all over the net. So please check us out there on whatever podcasting site you love the most. Uh, folks, as always, I can't thank you enough for making us a part of your golfing content. Until next week, hit them straight, my friend. You've been listening to Next on the G with Chris Mascaro, where PGA and LPGA pros and top instructors and media members go to tell their stories. Join us the same time every Tuesday. It's all about the great game of golf.